Very good afternoon, all. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's session. And today, this is a follow up of two days boot camp. This is total duration of four hours. So, the agenda for the day is uh, we will be doing a quick recap of what we have discussed yesterday. And then we will discuss uh, secure development of products according to IC 62443 4 1. Then bit on system security and component security according to 4-2 and 3-3. And then we'll discuss patch management, uh, the security profiles, and finally we'll end our session with cybersecurity management system according to IEC 62443 2-1. At the end of the session, we'll be taking questions similar to the same format which we had done yesterday, but we'll try to save a little bit more time today to answer your queries. Once again, I thank you all. And then before we start, a quick uh, disclaimer that whatever we are doing in the bootcamp is our personal opinion. If this has nothing to do with the organizations we are associated with. So please do not interpret it that way. Yeah, so quick recap. Yesterday, we had introduced 62443. We had discussed the life cycle and challenge in naughty security. We had done an overview of the standard about the different parts of the standard, the approved table versus the new developments in terms of profile and evaluation tiers. We discussed key terminology like defense in depth. We also discussed the security levels, maturity levels, type of security levels. We discussed zones and conduits. And at the end, we discussed risk assessment at large. With this, Today, we will be focusing on different part of the standard. We will be talking about 2-1, which is cybersecurity management system. Then we'll go to the jump uh, patch management also. We'll discuss the system level security requirement according to 3-3. In the component side, we'll discuss secure development 4-1, 4-2. And at, uh, on the profile side, we'll be discussing 1-5 as well. So this, uh, in summary, would be covering um, a good chunk of the standard. There are still some part of the standard which are under development and uh, not only will to be discussed 3-1 and 3-2 anyways we have discussed yesterday. So uh, yesterday there was a question that how do you uh, take action when you have residual risk and uh, unmitigated risk. So I put this one table just to uh, continue the discussion from there. So there are n number of possibilities when you do the risk treatment. The first one is risk avoidance. You will eliminate the risk by discontinuing the operation of that particular activity, which is causing the risk for you. The other one would be a reduction of the risk, which is you know putting additional countermeasures and then readjusting your risk either through incident detection system or maybe passive network anomaly detection system. Continuous monitoring could be one solution, white listing, access control, or maybe in some cases, compensating countermeasures like improving physical security, SIP registers, kind of thing. Then there is risk transfer, where you transfer your risk to a third party or an entity. One example is buying cyber insurance. We discussed this today. There is possibility of accepting the risk without taking any specific action that you know this is the risk and the cost-benefit ratio is not matching. So we will accept this risk and we'll document it. Finally, there is the possibility of risk sharing. If there are two or three different entities, which are your stakeholder, then you can transfer the risk to your stakeholders. There could be example of managed services in your organization, and then you transfer those risk to those managed service providers. Now we'll jump to secure development of the product. In the last few years, you see secure development is a very good focus for different entities. As BOM and all are the global talk now that uh, the governments, the standard development organization, they have been continuously asking that the OEMs and the product developers need to be transparent in their methodology of product development. So 62443 4-1 actually gives you different goals. First primary goal is to implement secure by design concept, and it also ensures defense intact. There, the, the, all these activities, they are spread across the entire life cycle of development, and it also ensures that security features of the product are applied correctly, and they maintain the security consistently. It is not like that you will implement the security now, 
and it will not work in the next version itself. So you see that uh, one of the thing which uh, these kind of product and initial control system product is frequent refer uh, refreshes of the uh, firmwares. So the primary goal of 4-1 that whenever you uh, upgrade the firmware or something like that, the feature should not be disabled and the feature should also remain secure and so that you are confident that your product is not getting downgraded in terms of the risk that they are pushing. Apart from these primary goals, there are some secondary goals which addresses the specific security needs of the integrators and the maintenance contractors since we know that in the uh, industrial automation and control system. Yesterday we discussed and uh, there are four different types of stakeholder, asset owners, system integrators, maintenance providers, and OEMs. So the standard actually focuses on the security requirements and the responsibility for integrator and maintenance providers as well. And one another aspect of 4-1 is emphasizes, emphasis on developing a strong documentation supporting the patch management and also providing proactive communication to the stakeholders about the vulnerabilities. We will talk about this specific communication requirement when we discuss the 2-3 uh, patch management part as well. Secure development lifecycle is actually driven from the secure development uh, or the, uh, the, the life cycle model of the software development. And all these different phases also apply to security of the product as well. In secure development life cycle, there are introduction of security specific consideration over and above the functional requirement of the software development. It will address not only the secure development of the product and system, but it will also focus on compliance requirement that may be set by specific government entity or specific sector. So they are basically providing development of security upfront. Initially, SDLC, Software Development Lifecycle, was for softwares, such, and also sometimes applicable to embedded products and hardwares, but the recently in IECS, they are also applicable to secure development. So uh, the standard basically talks about eight different practices and these practices are designed with defense in depth concept. At the outset or the outer layer is the security management, which is basically the program. How would you manage the overall security throughout the life cycle? What would be the scope of security for a product? What would be the people, the different roles, the requirement of doing the third party component analysis? All of that is part of the security management. Then there is an, another concentric circle, which has uh, five different practices. The, one of them is specification of security requirement according to that one particular product that you are developing. Next one is security by design. Implementation of security in a secure way. We have next to it a security verification and validation. So that testing is also an integral part of uh, product development. Then we have security related issue management. It could be like a uh, release of patch. Some uh, independent uh, security practitioner might find a vulnerability. He will report it to the organization and the organization might need to acknowledge it, find a patch, provide a compensating countermeasure. All of that is part of practices. Then there is process of security update management. This also relates to uh, the patch management and the responsibility of OEM. And finally, security guideline. All of them follow uh, best practices according to uh, security development life cycle. And since it's a policy and procedure requirement, the maturity levels which are given in 2-4 part of 62443, those maturity level will be applicable to this particular statement. Bit deep about those uh, practices, the first practices that we have seen is security management. Under the security management, there are 13 different requirements, starting from the development process, identification of the responsibilities, then identification of the applicability of security requirement, what are the security expertise that are required, <coughs> scoping the process, excuse me, 
the file integrity requirement, like how would you do code signing when you are developing a product uh, or an uh, firmware. Security of the development environment. So within the organization, if there is a development of uh, firmware, software or application, what is the security that you are providing? It will also include DevSec or something like that. There is a possibility that you are signing your code. And for this, you might require security of your uh, public key infrastructure or your private keys. So that is also part of your security management. There may be third parties you are using some components as bone, for example, is the requirement that is given here. So you need to have continuous monitoring of those components. It's under uh, some nine. Then the custom development and third party is maybe sometimes you require that uh, a part of your firmware or application requires to be developed by third party. So how would you secure that? And, and how do you manage them? It's part of SL10. Then addressing and assessing security related issues, uh, process verification, and finally continuous improvement. So you can see this is basically entire cybersecurity program correlatable according to the policies and procedure which you might see either in 2 1 and 27001 as well. Basically, the entire security program. Similarly, there are other practices. Uh, the uh, first one program management was the largest one. There were 13 different requirements are there, but in the remaining practices, there are different requirements. For example, like security requirement SR has five different requirements. Then you have requirement for product security context. So you need to do threat modeling of the product and you can identify the product security requirements and then security requirement reviews as well. Then you get into the security designing phase, security implementation, verification of it, management of the product, and finally, uh, management of update. And at the end of this, you will maintain the communication with your stakeholder for giving secure guidelines. This is one example of a certificate of uh, 2-1. Maybe I'll slightly zoom it out so that you can see. I have also put up the link and you can see how these certifications are given. So here it gives that out of those eight different practices, the organization had an identified how many of these requirements are applicable to them and the certification is given. So apart from the security management for this particular development factory, uh, all were applicable except one in, in security management. And the certification was given with maturity level four for this particular uh, plan. Or maybe it could be of a specific product development certification as well. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now we'll get into the component security. I'll hand over to Manju. And meanwhile, I'll be yeah. uh, seeing your questions as well, and we'll try to take them. Thanks, Shiv, uh, for explaining, uh, you know, the crisp and comprehensive overview on the 4-1, uh, which is very much uh, important. And also, it's a prerequisite for uh, when you are going for uh, any certification, component certification or system certification. 4-1 is uh, like a prerequisite. So when you get the certification, if you, uh, you know, look at closely, it is... Uh, clearly written that uh, you know you have already complying to SDLC process defined in the 624434-1 standard. Okay, so now we will talk about the component security and what are the components that we cover under 4-2. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, can we move to next slide, Shiv? Yes. So, uh, see the 4-2 talks about your you know, the technical security requirements for your IACS components. So components are nothing but your products used in the uh, industrial automation and control system environment. Basically, we talk about four main types according to this standard. One is host device, network device, embedded device, and software application. So when we say host device, it's like operator station, engineering station, or maybe data historian. Uh, likewise, you know, when it comes to network devices, VPN terminators, switches, firewalls, rotors, etc., and embedded device, PLCs, RTUs, IDDs, software 
okay these are comes under embedded device so software application like scada application access control application operator stations hmi etc so now so if you ask me how you know important for you all these uh, main types so if you are working with oems or if you are an asset owner or end user right so you know i will first i'll touch upon the oem side if you are working with oems okay so you may be you know uh, providing these switches like then you will come under network device requirement which is specified in the 62403 standard but if you are you know manufacturing all the plcs rtus ieds or such kind of embedded devices then you are part of embedded device requirement in short it is edr okay then you know you are creating some kind of software application uh, like scada related stuff and then you are come under software application devices or maybe uh, operator or engineering station or data historian then you are part of post devices uh, requirements you have to follow so each of these requirements are specifically you know um, how it differs you know basically when you go for a certification the one thing is as an oem it is you know maybe your company might have set this target security level uh, you know yesterday we discussed about sl1 to sl4 depending on uh, the you know the protection against the uh, sophisticated attacks so i think what we have seen uh, in the current past that so far we have seen many components or systems are certified for sl1 certification which is very basic uh, you know uh, of the foundational requirements again you know how it is uh, you know segregated or uh, access uh, we will discuss in detail uh, in the coming slides yeah so shiv can we move yeah, yeah. Yes. so already i have this uh, you know uh, explained about this right the product supplier requirements for control system security components so as a as an asset owner or as an oem you will set the target security level for example maybe some of uh, if you are from marine background or marine customer or marine uh, you know if you are working with the marine industry then you might set the target security level as sl2 then you will work towards it then how it differs from sl1 yesterday we discussed about seven foundational requirements fr1 to fr7 under each fr there will be you know certain like how shiv has explained under each you know srs i mean say uh, stlc requirements there will be certain subset of requirements right similarly for each of the frs there will be component requirements for each of the section so what are those frs the first one i will take an example as you know identification and authentic authentication control iac in short so under that we uh, you know the standard defines that cr 1.1 that is component requirement 1.1 under which it describes so as an oem product what it has to comply with it will not tell you that how to comply but what to comply so that is most important because you might uh, for example if i want to take uh, you know the standard says that you have to use encryption but it is up to you which kind of encryption that you want to use there will be definitely some rational and the supporting document supporting guidance is defined in the standard but still you know it is up to your uh, convenience that how far you want to secure it and then there will be uh, you know the certifying body who will verify all such things so if you are falling under the category of network devices uh, yeah this is what uh, yeah we can uh, move ahead uh, shiv yeah this is the mapping of crs CR means component requirements. RE means requirement enhancement. I will come to that, and then uh, under each FRs, and it is mapped with SL one to three four. So I'll give you an example. Now Cisco switches are SL one com compliant. Okay, when you are looking for a project in a project that you are uh, you know you are using Cisco switches, but whether it is compliant uh, you know as per your compliance, it has to comply with SL one. That means. for you under fr1 cr1.1 is holds good but re1 and re2 which talks about unique identification and multi factor authentication that is not required under sl1 but whereas if you are falling under sl2 or if you are aiming for sl2 or sl3 sl4 so on 
then re1 and re2 is old school so it's a you know uh, the screenshot what we have displayed here it's from the annexure okay from the 4-2 so it is a ready made uh, you know annexure where you can just copy these things into an excel sheet create your all the you know fr1 to fr7 you list down under each fr you list down all the cr and re's everything and if you are aiming for sl1 then okay filter out only the tick mark under sl1 then against each of that it is not necessary that you have to take all the description that is just for your reference so in short maybe you can list down and uh, you know you make a compliance verification chart so this helps you as a consultant as well when you are uh, you know going for a consulting uh, uh, of whether the product is really you know certified for 4-1 then even you can use the same uh, excel file or same annexure i would say so yeah can we move uh, yes yeah yeah so this is what uh, as i told you under fr there will be multiple crs like cr1 1.1 1.2 1.3 1.4 like that cr1.3 1.3 or 1.4 so and fr2 again uh, you know which has some sub uh, requirements so it defines as cr so why this cr it's a component requirement here one catch is there suppose if you are from you know, uh, like a manufacturer, switch manufacturer or network device manufacturer, then you have to, you know, keep an emphasis on these NDRs. NDRs means network device requirement. So in the annexure, if you look at the, uh, you know, SRs and REs column, where CR, uh, if you see now under CR 1.5, RE1 is there and NDR 1.6. So likewise, you will have EDR 1.6 if it is applicable. Likewise, you will have HDR 1.6. Suppose if it is not there, then it is not applicable for your, uh, you know, devices or component. So this is the most important part when you map this into Excel sheet. Okay. And then now if you see, yeah, this is what I wanted to explain. So this, uh, if you go through the uh, standard, you will see the foundational requirement first, like identity and access management and then under that you will have the purpose and what is the capability of security level what is the capability capability of your component which is capable like whether it is capable of handling sl1 related uh, you know uh, requirements or sl2 or sl3 or sl4 likewise and they have given the rationale also for each of these uh, you know foundational requirements as well as the subcategory component requirements like CR 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, so and forth. And this under each of the component requirement, there is a requirement subsection heading and the rational and supplemental guidelines and the requirement and in front that is REs. Okay. For each of the category, they have written what is what is that you need to, you know, um, require to achieve this certification or to meet those security requirements. Yeah, so uh, I mean, this is just for a guidance that they have given. It will not tell you that how to achieve those. It will tell you, okay, what has to be there in your product. So that is what is important. Can we move uh, to the next slide? I'll show you. Uh, yeah, so this is a screenshot from we have taken from 62443 standard. This is how it looks like. Uh, you know, this is a glimpse of how it, you know, we have just mapped it. Under FR1, if you see, there is the purpose and the SLC descriptions, and then the rational, and then see under CR 1.1, they have written as a requirement. Okay, what that you need to comply. Uh, and also some of the supplement guidelines also they have given. Uh, so it is better that, you know, when you do this, uh, you know, exercise, always you go and go back and refer. Because many a times, you know, we hear from people uh, through LinkedIn or somewhere, they, they want somebody's help to understand this component requirements to map to their components. Okay. Recently, you know, uh, I think a few months back that one of the company uh, contacted me to uh, map this, uh, you know, component security, but they are from IOT uh, related stuff. But when you look at this EDR, SDR, there, there was no mentioning of IOT. So then, when we talk about IOT, uh, you know, thing, even 
the same 4-2 standard is applicable because that IIoT components also part of 4-2 and the ISA secure uh, certification scheme has involved such uh, you know uh, IoT component also into 4-2 scheme. Can we move uh, to the next slide, please? Yeah. So this is one of the sample uh, you know uh, the component security which Siemens has achieved. Uh, that is uh, Grid Pass. So uh, one of the screenshot that. Uh, you know, uh, the component security, uh, you can see that the green highlighted uh, columns like security level 1, 2, 3, 4. That means under the data confidentiality, the Siemens uh, SciCam grid pass is CR 4.1 is uh, achieved. They can achieve up to SL4. CR 4.2, they can achieve up to SL4. And similarly, there is no RE 1, 2. It is red. That is meant not implemented. So what does that mean is, so if any of the CR, which is not comply with SL4, for example, I have explained CR 1.1 to 1.13 and like uh, other FRs. So in that case, some of the FRs you are complying with SL4, some of the FRs we, you are not complying with SL4 or maybe SL2. But ultimately, when we look at the whole summary of FR1 to FR7, if any of this, uh, you know, FRs, which will not fall under SL4 or SL3, only, you know, the common uh, column where you can see the tick mark is only SL2, that then your certifying body will issue only SL2, not SL4, even though you are, achieve, you are able to achieve the uh, SL4 for other component requirements, but not for the others. So the minimum what you are achieving is SL2. Okay, so that's what this column says. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this is one of the you know uh, even I have put the uh, you know the link as well in this slide. This is one of the example for four two. Okay, uh, how this is from the Cisco switch Cisco example. How Cisco is achieving this CR you know 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. If you want to understand how they are achieving. What are they considering? So this is the example that uh, we have taken. Uh, we will share you the link. So you go through the you know link and understand how they have explained. For example, under the identification and the access control, so they are able to achieve uh, the multi-factor authentication as well. How they are achieving? They have the technology like Cisco, ISC they have. Okay, that is the service engine. They have identity service engine. And then uh, they have cyber vision. They have secure firewall. Uh, not to mention, you know, we are taking example which is available in the public. It's not to, you know, uh, endorse any such, uh, like we are also seeing some of the example from 14 as because of the time constraint, we are just taking the Cisco example and it's not that. And in some of the, you know, Hushman switches also and 14 at, and there are many other switches which are complied for 62443 nowadays because of, of the, you know, the competent world and everybody started jumping into the 62443, which is uh, actually compliant. And it's a requirement for any uh, OT security vendors. Okay, so this is one such example how they are achieving the FR1. Okay, so can we move to the next slide? Uh, uh, so this is how they are achieving through ISC, that is, uh, you know, the uh, identification service engine. Uh, so the Alice uh, has requested for the, you know, the identification through PLCs as well. Uh, so this flow you can understand. This is just to give you a glimpse how internally you can be prepared yourself to uh, achieve those, uh, you know, comply to this CRs. Okay, so we have given the PDF as well, a PDF link. So when we share, you can go through that. Yeah. Yes, now coming back, to, now we have learned all these things, 4-2. But for me, why does it matter? What I will do with this information? If you are working with OEM, tomorrow you get a project you have to work on saying that, you know, your company has assigned you a work that our product should be certified with, uh, you know, SL1, for example, or SL2. Then who will approve it? You know, who, uh, for, uh, whom I should approach? It's not everybody who can certify your component. Please be aware if somebody comes and tell you that, okay, we can, uh, you know, certify your components. That's not true. So ISA secure organization has these certification scheme and under them, 
there are certain you know certifying bodies like exida tuv and there are tuv so tuv renland and there are many other uh, maybe some 6 7 if you go back, go to isa or uh, secure.org you will get more information on this what is the certification scheme so there are you know the four or five types of uh, you know certification scheme provided by the isa secure one is component security assurance that is csa so csa means uh, whatever we have discussed so far those are comes under component security assurance and uh, i talked about iot so they have the iot component security assurance icsa if you see the below the certification to 62443 4-2 so they have clearly written and the third one is system security assurance ssa that is 3-3 so uh, that we will discuss in the coming slides when we touch upon the uh, system level and then security development life cycle assurance that is sdla assurance okay that means you have to comply for you know the stlc process defined in the 4-1 and just to note that you know uh, for this to get the csa or icsa or ssa your sdla is you know a uh, prerequisite that is mandatory so once you have achieved that then only you know the certifying bodies like exida tuvs uh you know there are uh, many other uh, certifying bodies will go ahead with the csa or ssa or icsa for that matter okay please remember this so how do they verify is there are some certain steps which they follow i'll just give you a glimpse of it so that you know you, you can understand it better uh so initially you know uh, since we talk about security development life cycle you have the product security team where they understand while developing the applications Are relevant to the uh, industrial automation and control system security is by default you are including in your design okay you ha- you have to perform lot of vulnerability assessments pen testing and some first testing lot many uh, you know the uh, when you go back to the csa documentation there is a checklist where you need to follow certain things and it will be a, you know you have to do a lot many work yesterday i think some of you were asking about threat modeling and risk assessment all this will be part of this certification scheme okay the companies will ask i mean the certifying body will ask all these uh, you know the evidences that you are doing you are testing internally as well not only security point of view some functionality tests as well okay so this is how and you have to show the evidences and then once you you show the evidence and then if they agree and they will you need to demonstrate online or maybe they can take your uh, you know they will sign an nda they will take your product or so- software or maybe you can show it uh, online uh, with the consent and then they will verify it so once everything is done and then you can easily uh, you know achieve your certification i am glad that i have been part of this certification scheme uh, for past maybe 2 3 years uh, which i gained a good amount of knowledge for specifically the 3-3 one and the 4-2 so 4-2 uh, you know i worked uh, much so if you have any questions maybe i can take it up later or maybe you can connect with me on linkedin or you can put it in the chat box yeah uh, uh, shiv can you move next slide yeah maybe we'll yeah before jumping later. into three yeah yeah sure so um, so when we talk about uh, system so now that we have completed 4-2 uh, we, you know you hope you might have got an idea this is specific to the you know the component level now system security means what does that mean it's that you know uh, you have we have discussed so far so many uh, components so the, those group of components where you have yesterday we have seen so many architecture system architecture system under consideration we have talked about so that is system security okay where it comes i'll explain in the coming slides can we move uh, shiv yeah so uh, this is actually it defines the you know the security requirements and the security capability levels to build an iacs that meets the target security level and evaluate your practice for each of requirement so what is the difference between your system security and the component security under component security you have different components like plc switches firewalls hmi stations engineering station workstations etc but grouping all this and communicating with each other yesterday we have talked about zones conduits right those things are coming into the system security 
and you know the same sl1 to sl4 holds good for the same and same fr1 to fr7 that is how it is linked and there we talked about the component requirement that is for each of the component here we are talking about as a whole system that is system requirement in short it is sr so in 4-2 it is cr here it is sr the requirement enhancement it's re there also it is re that is an additional requirement to meet sl2 or 3 4 okay so now under system security you know uh, this is actually a, you know the more work because there are many components involved so there are some questions might arise if i am from oem which has many products ultimately you know i will have i will be supplying the entire system for my customer so which one should i go with should i go with 3-3 or 4-2 it's a good question right it depends on the company's business objective and also the budget approval because sometimes company feels that uh, you know the component level is good enough because the same controller can be used uh, for example same plc or same dcs or same rdus might be used in multiple projects but not as a whole system because in us uh, you know for oems you know sometimes it it is difficult to sell the whole system right uh, but if you are getting that system security you know certification then you are in good position but the only concern is let us say in system security you have different components as we discussed what if my plc got updated to the next level and what if my switch uh, from cisco or uh, harshman or you know fortinet or some other vendor it got updated then Again, I have to do the certification for 3-3 for minor uh, this thing. There is also a, a you know a procedure. So that's why when we uh, want to decide whether should I go with the system security or component security depends on what kind of you know uh, changes that you are going to see foresee. Okay, Th that is where your uh, you know the uh, the planning is very much required when you want to choose between system security and uh, uh, component security can we move to next slide yeah so who are the you know uh, intended audience for system security uh, asset owner definitely because uh, ultimately it will be the end users and system integrators as well sometimes you know they procure uh, different manufacturers plc research dcs uh, you know scada systems and then uh, product supplier definitely and the service providers uh, who will also be, uh, you know, has to refer this 3-3 uh, and uh, obviously compliance authorities, government agencies, regulators, because, you know, nowadays when we go, when you read through the uh, bidding document that uh, it's clearly written, you have to abide by this 62443 standard. So then uh, you have to, uh, you know, use. And then uh, usage is already have explained, uh, you know, uh, it depends on the, the uh, you know, the depends on the asset owner security policies, procedures, site specific risk assessment, like SL1 or SL2, SL3, SL4. You know, as discussed in the component level uh, security in the system, also we have SL1 to SL4. The same, uh, you know, it's exactly copy paste. The only difference is under system, there is no NDR, there is no EDR, there is no HDR, or there is no, uh, you know, application level uh, device requirement. So this is where you have to, uh, you know, that's the only difference you can see in the annexure, what we have shown, right? So that's the only difference what we can see. So apart from that, the entire system, but the, own, uh, you know, when you read through the rational, right? So, uh, I mean, the structure of 3-3 and the 4-2 is almost similar because uh, I should have touched 3-3 first, but since, you know, I wanted to give that linkage, uh, because 3-3 uh, was developed uh, in the beginning and then 4-2 uh, came in the picture. Uh, but if you look at the uh, document or standard, uh, both are holds good. And the, when they, you know, are uh, when they developed the, you know, 4-2, they borrowed from uh, the same concept from 3-3 actually. So just that they have changed the name from SR to CR. Yeah. Can we move to the next slide, please, uh, Shiv? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So... As I told you, the same, you know, the structure follows the foundational requirement FR127 and then the purpose SL and then uh, here SR1.1, there we have seen CR1.1. 
okay the requirement rational supplement guidance uh, everything is same when you read through the requirement right for the component it is only applicable for only the relevant uh, component but when we talk about system requirements right so the entire system comes into picture so they will write that your control system but whereas in cr 1.1 they might say that your component or maybe your controller or maybe your network switch so likewise they will mention the control network switch uh, one interesting thing here now in the system security we have different components what if one component is does not uh, meets the you know the 4-2 certification okay my plc is already 4-2 certified what if my switch is not 4-2 certified how can i go ahead with that that is where your srs comes into picture let us say under iac okay identification and access control so if your centralized access control is able to meet right as an oem you might have some iac uh, services it's not necessary that your individual switches or individual component should be certified for 4-2 as a whole system if it meets those requirement defined in srs that is more than sufficient okay it is not necessary that every component ultimately what is your objective you have to meet those security requirement as a whole system okay sometimes we often get confused with these kind of scenarios okay so but uh, nevertheless but you know you can still uh, uh, meet those requirements even though your individual component is not uh, certified for 62443 but as a whole system if you are able to protect your system then that is more than sufficient because it's it's you know meeting your sr 1.1 requirements or sr you know other requirements yeah can we move ahead yeah before we move ahead uh, i yeah. would like to add something here i am also seeing some questions related to this uh, as you rightly pointed out that having a component level certification for a system which is using that particular component is absolutely not necessary you can actually google and find there are pcs7 siemens pcs7 624423 certification pcs7 is a component you have uh, it's a system you will have a system level certificate similarly secure substation blueprint 3-3 certificate is there for food and beverage also there is a certification uh, and uh, there is one more uh, system level certificate available all of them are 62443 certified for a specific blueprint that basically make, means that entire architecture is certified even though the components that are used in those architectures they are not 62443 certified necessarily like if you see an ideal situation that you would assume that every single component that i'm using in a system should be 62443 certified as well but that's not the necessity i'll give you an example uh, why it is not the necessity is let's say you want a, a security level 4 compliance for your uh, identification and authentication control which basically tells that you need to have two factor authentication for all of your system and the components so you have a network switch now switch might not have the capability in itself so what you can do the switch might have a radius integration capability you will put active directory on the controller a radius on it and the radius will authenticate through two different two factor authentication at the system level you are achieving it but the component level you might not have that capability implemented so that is why it makes more sense to do a system level certification and system level work for doing 6443 compliance rather than focusing on the component level. Okay, now over to you. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, we have already explained this. Uh, this is just an example how it looks like. Uh, like in the component we have already covered. So, uh, if you can read out this, you know, uh, what explains this SR 1.1 requirement. So here, if you see, it says that the control system shall provide the capability to identify and authenticate all human users. So the one thing to notify is, you know, it will not dictate you that how to achieve those, you know, it is not dictating that what to achieve. So it is, uh, you know, written. 
so it's up to your uh, you know organization to how to achieve them that's it yeah 